the first speaker. May Rav see see happy. Uh, yes, one second. I think she is not there yet. Yeah, I don't see the name in the the list. In case we don't have the speaker, should we uh, go to the second one? I, I see that Barth Jensen is already here. So just in case that the first speaker is not available, Barth, would you mind to be the first one? Sure, I'd be happy to. We are live. We can start now. Okay, let's, uh, let's just, just, just to make sure that the First speaker is indeed not here. Mirel, Mirel. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see the name. So anyway, so uh, thanks for everyone for coming here, uh, coming to this session. Um, this is um, uh, IPOP session uh, E3. So the first speaker is not here yet. So let's start from the second one. Uh, Bart, can you share your screen? Sure. Let's see. So basically, they, um, we have 60 minutes for six talks. So each person, each speaker will have around 10 minutes, including both uh, two or three minutes for a very brief introduction of the main results of the paper, and also uh, followed by uh, like uh, seven or eight minutes of question and answer. Okay, Bart, if you are ready, then uh, please go ahead. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bart. This is joint work with Marianne Bougeret and Ignacy Sau, and it's work about data reduction with a guarantee for the vertex cover problem, so kernelization. In kernelization, we ask if inputs to hard decision problems that have small complexity parameters can be reduced to inputs with the same answer, but whose size depends only um, by polynomial on the complexity of this input instance. And here we analyzed the complexity parameters of vertex cover inputs that you get by taking, well, to measure how complicated my input is, I see how many vertices I have to delete until my graph lands into a simple graph class, such as the class of forest. And there's been a number of kernelizations for vertex cover for ever more general classes replacing forests so that the deletion distance parameter you get becomes ever smaller. And the question was, what are the most general target classes for which the corresponding parameterizations still give you polynomial kernels? And we answered this question. We introduced a new graph parameter we call bridge depth. It has a recursive definition similar to the notion of tree depth in which all bridges are contracted for free, basically. And using this notion, we prove that for a minor closed uh, class of graphs under the standard assumption, vertex cover parameterized by deletion distance to a family F as a polynomial kernel, if and only if this family F has a bounded bridge step value. You can think of this as the ultimate tractable generalization for the class F of forest, for which kernels were known before, and classes of bounded tree depth graphs, which were known before, and it's generalized all of these deep deterministic known kernels. Our proof relies on various graph theoretic concepts around bridge depth and relations to blocking sets, which are summarized in the following picture. So a minor closed family F has bounded bridge depth, if and only if the minimal blocking set sizes of graphs in its family are constant, if and only if nextless models um, illustrated by this picture have constant size. And this then is connected also to being able to kernelize the vertex cover problem where the parameter is the deletion distance to this minor closed family, F. And this ends my summary. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks. Um, is there any question from the audience? Uh, yeah, can I, can I ask? Shoot. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Bart. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, so nice. Thanks for the nice talk. I have two set of questions. Uh, so the first one is uh, like looking at your paper and the talk. Uh, I gather the kernel size would be something like a modulator power, like exponential in bridge depth. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so 
the exponent of the polynomial, it grows with the bridge depth of the family and actually it grows exponentially with the bridge depth of the family. And this exponential growth was already known uh, to be unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, so yeah, that was my question. So we cannot avoid that. Like, so we cannot expect say modulator power bridge width kind of uh, uh, like um, the kernel size, which is uh, in which the polynomial is say, uh, constant, uh, sorry, uh, the size of a kernel would be like say mod X power, uh, some polynomial of bridge depth. No, it is really needs to be an exponential function of bridge depth, yeah. Uh, okay, so it is under what uh, condition? Like under the standard um, that NP is not contained uh, in cone P. Okay, slash cone P slash okay. Yeah. Uh, and is it the same case with the uh, running time? Like when you say the running time, it's polynomial. And let's say it's n power C. So what's the dependence of a uh, bridge width on this C? So at some point in the algorithm to reduce the number of connected components, you have mm -hmm. to do a marking scheme that basically okay. marks some components um, for every choice of a blocking set, the notion in the top right of my uh, slide. Okay. And basically the running time will be n to the power blocking set size uh, if you execute all the steps of the kernel as they are normally. But okay. there's sort of a trick, a trade-off that you can do um, for a lot of kernelization algorithms. Also for this one, mm -hmm. you can say if the graph is not very large compared to what the output bound of my kernel should be, then actually maybe I don't have to kernelize it. And oh, yeah. otherwise I can use the fact that the graph is much larger than what my output size will be to sort of get a, a, a better analysis. Linear. Okay, so it would be some like n squared or n cube, that kind of thing. So it's yeah. not like that. Okay, nice. Uh, and so, so second line of question would be, uh, this bridge width, seems to be an interesting parameter but uh, so do you think there will be some problem which admits an fpt algorithm by this parameter but doesn't admit an fpt algorithm by tree width which i think is a smaller parameter um tree width is indeed a smaller parameter and i think that if you look at examples where tree width and tree depth behave differently, okay, um, there are a number uh, of such examples. And mm -hmm. for those type of problems, I expect that bridge depth will behave closer like tree depth. So okay. it will be tractable and tree width will still be untractable. Intractable. Okay. Um... So uh, one last question, this is a bit of an open-ended. So what would be the, uh, like, what was your intuition? Like you, if you contract the bridges, the problem seems to be much more tractable than this thing. So why just allowing to contract the bridges kind of works for you or works in this domain? So I will take this to uh, be a question of how we got to this parameter. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, yeah. So if you look at the um, gadget, which is drawn on the right, which is basically mm -hmm. this path of triangles, then okay. this is the structure that gives you kernelization lower bounds. Okay. Um, so if the triangles are connected in such a way that um, there is a path through the triangles visiting two vertices of one triangle, then two vertices of the next, then such structures give you lower bounds that was already known. If you have a path of triangles where the path visits one vertex in every triangle, mm -hmm. then it doesn't give you lower bounds. Actually, you can make kernels for that problem quite easily. So to understand what really the distinguishing notion was, we needed something that distinguishes on the one hand, um, graphs that have a path of triangles where the path takes two vertices at a time, from okay. paths of triangles where the path takes one vertex at a time. And these two classes both have large mm -hmm. tree depth, but we mm -hmm. knew that one led to polynomial kernels and one did not. And oh. if you have a path where only one vertex of each triangle is visited by the path, and actually the edges between these triangles are bridges, mm -hmm. so that contracting them gives you a small complexity parameter. And here, if you contract the bridges, you still get a long path, so a large value of the parameter. And basically, this was the motivating example for why contracting bridges was the right way to characterize whether things should be complex graphs or simple graphs for this uh, kernelization question. OK, thank you so much. Thanks for the nice questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the questions and answers. Uh, are there more questions? 
Well, the time is also oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just curious if there was a um, what the relation between bridge depth and tree depth was. Um, so in one direction, the bridge depth is never larger uh, than the tree depth, but the other direction can be unbounded. In particular, a path on n vertices, it has tree depth log n, but the bridge depth is constant because all of these edges are bridges in a path. You can track them for free and then you delete this one bricks in one step. So the bridge depth of any tree is just one, but trees can have arbitrarily large tree depth. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, as the time is, uh, is almost there, so let's switch to the next speaker. Um, I checked the list, I still don't find the uh, author, the speaker of the first paper. Uh, just in case, uh, does any any author from the first paper uh, actually uh, is actually here? Okay, then probably not. So, so let's go to the third. Third one, uh, I think the third one is uh, third one is by uh, Ofer Macken. Ofer, uh, Ofer, can can you can you first unmute your speaker, sir, uh, microphone? Okay, sorry, can you hear okay, me? Okay, great. Yeah, great. Okay. thanks. Please go ahead. Yeah, please start to share a screen. So yeah, I'll. So this is a joint work with Shiri Chechik. Both of us are from Tel Aviv University. And we will discuss the replacement pass problem, which is a notable example in the field of fault tolerance. So the problem is described as following. We are given some graph G and the shortest path 3K, which is rooted at some vertex source S. We are then requested for every edge failure E in this shortest path 3K, to compute the, and for every destination vertex v, x, sorry, to compute the distance between the source and the destination with the edge failure removed from the graph. So of course there is a trivial solution for this, uh, which is simply uh, removing each edge failure and computing a Dijkstra call. And since if the number of edges is m and the number of vertices is n, this will take us uh, m times n time. And the question is, is there a better than trivial solution for this problem? And uh, due to a line of a paper previously made, uh, it is shown that in the case where the edge weights are arbitrary, there is, no, there is little hope to achieve better than trivial uh, running time. So we must restrict our edge weights in some manner. A very natural way to do so is to consider only unweighted graphs. And that's what we do in this paper. Uh, so for the case of uh, unweighted graphs, there is a very, there, it's very ex extensively researched. And for the case where both the, uh, both the source is fixed and the destination is fixed, for the case of undirected graphs, it was shown uh, that uh, by Malik, Mittal, and Gupta in uh, 1989, that a near linear time algorithm can be achieved. Uh, but uh, for, the, um, for the directed case, it was shown in 2005 that an m square root of n time algorithm can be achieved. And this algorithm was later shown in 2012 to be uh, nearly optimal uh, under some reasonable assumptions. Uh, for the case where the destination isn't fixed, uh, rather recently in 2019, it was shown by Chechik and Cohen that uh, one can match the uh, rodetti and Zwick's algorithm and uh, they have provided uh, an m square root of m plus n square time algorithm. And an n square time is necessary since we have n destination and edge, fa n edge failures. And this, uh, as you can see, there's an interesting gap between, also between undirected and directed graphs, but also between the uh, fixed des destination case and the uh, arbitrary destination case. And this uh, begs the question if there is a, a third gap. What is uh, what completes this picture? So in this paper, we complete the picture of a replacement path in unweighted graphs, and we provide an m square root of n plus n squared time uh, algorithm for the directed uh, all destination case. Uh, all the all the algorithm in this all the algorithms in this table are uh, essentially op optimal among all combinatorial algorithms uh, by some 
conditional combinatorial lower bound shown by Vasilevska, Williams, and Williams. Uh, in this paper, we also provide a new non combinatorial conditional lower bound uh, for the case of small rational edge weights, which is, uh, to the best of our knowledge, the, the first time that this kind of scenario was uh, considered. Uh, if there are any questions so far, I think it's better to it's better to answer them now. Uh, so, the basic nature of our algorithm is a, a divide and conquer algorithm. So we split the graphs into in the graph into two uh, almost equally sized uh, trees using a balanced tree separator, uh, and we recursively solve the question uh, on every tree. So let's take a look of one of these trees and consider an edge failure in uh, the path from the source to the separator. Uh, if the replacement path is fully contained within the tree, then we can simply invoke a recursive call, but it might not be the case and the replacement path may take some path that goes through the right tree. In which case we need to add some detours that uh, the, some shortcuts that represent the, the path that went from here to here. But as stated before, we cannot handle uh, arbitrarily weighted graphs. So this will, we, we won't be able to recursively invoke this. But we've, we've shown in the paper that if we add only weights from the source to other vertices, uh, then the, then you can still uh, solve the problem recursively since the, the weights are still restricted in a manner. So uh, this brings some problems, but uh, that uh, in the full version and the talk we discuss how we solve them, but uh, this is the general idea of the algorithm. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we have like uh, four minutes for some questions. Is there any question about this paper to offer? We have one question. So what are small rational weights? So is that just a, a bound, uh, an absolute bound on the, the weights or? Uh, so, so we told that uh, we stated that we can only consider uh, unweighted graphs, but the algorithm can actually be, be uh, can be generalized to edge weights that are between one and some constant c, and this is a rather interesting the rather interesting uh, because uh, other algorithms weren't. Uh, such as algebraic algorithms weren't able to handle rational edge weights. So they are small in the sense that the largest weight divided, largest weight divided by the smallest weight is some constant. I see. We have more questions. Well, uh, it's fine. Uh, we still have time for asking uh, questions for all the previous speakers you know, at the end of the session if we, if we still have time. I see that uh, actually the first speaker uh, came. Um, so, Mayraf, uh, are you ready for, for the next one? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Great. thank you. Great. Okay, please go ahead. Um, so I will show screen just a second. I'm really sorry for the delay. I had a technical problem uh, with my Wi-Fi. So I will only say a few uh, words uh, and uh, you can uh, watch the full uh, presentation uh, for more details. 
So in this paper, we consider the Hardwiger number problem, and we also showed that uh, our approach uh, is applicable to other contraction problems. Where in particular, we were interested in uh, obtaining tight lower bounds under the ETH. So just a short introduction, uh, so we will know what is the topic of the paper. So here we talk uh, about uh, minors, so the main problem concerns minors. And we said that the graph H is a minor of a graph G if we can obtain uh, H by doing in G a series of operations where we contract edges, delete edges, or delete vertices. So here uh, I, I'm just going briefly over this presentation, the full talk uh, is online. Um, so this is the presentation of the full talk. In particular, we uh, talk about the Hadwiger number of a graph, which concerns the largest integer edge such that you can find the click on edge vertices, k edge, as a minor of g. So it was known that this problem can be trivially solved in time n to the order n. And then it was an open problem whether uh, this time is tight. And in particular, can we solve this problem in single exponential time in n, in time two to the order n? Uh, this is a special case of the more general graph minor problem where we ask whether a, a given input graph is a minor of a different uh, input uh, graph. So um, what I want to say about this is that uh, there is an interesting discussion about the relation between uh, our problem where we want to uh, ask what the largest click that is contained in the minor and other problems, uh, in particular subgraph isomorphism, subgraph homomorphism, uh, graph minor, topological graph minor. And uh, when you look at this discussion, then uh, it actually uh, uh, makes the result uh, look surprising because uh, this particular problem behaves differently than the other ones. So uh, here are the, are the definitions. You can look at uh, the full talk for more information of them. Where uh, the point that I want to highlight about this is uh, that when we talk about uh, the case of a click and when it is a graph uh, homomorphism or a topological graph minor, or uh, then uh, uh, all of these problems actually have uh, algorithms that running two to the order n. But in contrast, when we seek uh, uh, the click as a, a minor and not say as a, a, a subgraph, as in subgraph isomorphism, this problem, actually this uh, missing uh, part here in the table, the answer is no. So it behaves very differently. And um, what we showed in the paper, the main result is that unless the ETH fails, then the, uh, this problem, the Heidegger number problem, uh, cannot be solved in time to uh, n to the little o of n. Uh, so this solved the open question that was asked in several venues. And uh, what I also want to say about this is that uh, actually uh, the approach that we used, we were able to use it to show lower bounds for uh, many other contraction uh, problems as well. So uh, more, more uh, generally, what do we mean by contraction problems here? So we mean that uh, given some graph G and a non-negative -in uh, integer T, we ask if we can contract at most T edges in G to obtain the graph in some family F, say a chordal graph, an interval graph, depends what is the family F. And uh, what we saw uh, as consequences of our approach is that a lot of problems do not admit uh, algorithms that run in time and to the little of n. This includes click contraction, which is actually uh, very similar or, uh, uh, to the Hadwiger number problem, caudal graph contraction, contraction to interval graphs, proper interval graphs, and many more. And it all follows from the same uh, uh, approach. So we start with some uh, certain problem that was uh, appeared in a previous paper on which we build upon. And we give a, cert a series of uh, reductions where in the end we uh, uh, get to a very structured contraction problems from which we can uh, uh, devise reductions to a lot of contraction problems, including Hardwiger number problems and many others. Okay, so uh, I think this is all uh, uh, I will share uh, in this uh, short presentation. And I can take uh, questions now. Uh, I see there is already a question in the uh, chat. Do, uh, so I will read the question. Do your results imply 
anything for approximating the Hardwiger number, for example, can you rule out the constant factor approximation algorithm in two to the order uh, n time? Uh, so I do not think so, but uh, this requires uh, more thought. So I will, um, so I can give a more meaningful uh, answer. But at least uh, um, as it is, uh, this is not uh, clear that uh, it would imply. Uh, so I have a question, Mera. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the thing is, you mentioned that this Hadwinger number uh, is an FPT uh, parameterized by the size of resulting graph. Yes. The, yes. Uh, yeah, so this, this is more general. Uh, this is more generally true for the graph minor problem. Exactly. Right. So yeah. this FPT came uh, from your uh, Robertson Simmer theorem. Yes. Uh, so, do we know anything better for this special case? Uh, of a click? Of a click, yeah. Um, so, for the FPT setting... Uh, uh, I do not know. Uh, I, 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 I need to think about this. Uh, it might be that for the special case of a click, uh, we can do better. Okay. Yes, because we got a lot of arguments uh, that mm -hmm. came from there. They handle the case actually when we don't have a large click minor. Okay. So I, I don't want to just so, answer mm -hmm. uh, now, but uh, maybe. So I will just but, say maybe. Okay, but uh, there is a hope that uh, with the ideas we used, we can like hammer it more to get a better FPT algorithm for this problem. Uh, maybe uh, notice that in uh, this paper uh, we uh, talk about okay. uh, exponential time algorithms. So it is a different yes. uh, question. Then you can solve it in time. Uh, I mean, this, this is what we, we want to ask, whether you could have solved it in time to do the order n. And then um, this, no. But uh, for FPT, this, this is a different uh, question than what we do. OK, sure. So uh, another. Uh, I mean, again, in the same domain of an FPT. So you proved this lower bound. Uh, do you think the uh, the machinery which you use crucially depends on n? In other words, can we have some FPT lower bounds? Again, like modifying on your idea, or the dependency on n is very crucial. Um, I mean, so so the the answer is that as it as it looks like. It seems crucial, but I mean, of course, okay. one can maybe use these uh, ideas in okay. some uh, clever way and, and, and get uh, other things uh, out of it. But uh, as it is, I, I do not know. Uh... Okay. okay. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mero. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Are there more questions? Uh, so I have a comment on the question that Part asked, if you have a time. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes, uh, so uh, it is known that there is a small constant that in polynomial time, you cannot do, uh, you cannot approximate the Sadwinger number better than that constant. But it's not true for all the constant. We just know there exists a constant that we cannot do better than that. So... Okay, thank you. That's for polynomial time approximation. Yes, that's for polynomial time. All right. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, more questions or comments? Okay, if, uh, if not, then let's uh, move to the next one. Um, the next speaker is Sean Beller. Sean here. Yes, Sean is here. Sean, please uh, share your screen and you can start. Um, Sean, we can't hear you. Hi, Sean, we can see your screen. Uh, you can just go to the presentation. Yeah, 
presentation mode and start. I can see that Sean's mic is on, but uh, I can't yeah, hear him. For some reason. Yeah. Sean, can you hear us? Uh, Sean, please check in the lower left edge of Zoom whether you selected the correct microphone. On the microphone button, there's a button up which points upwards. There you can select a microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Oh, yes, great. Wait for that. Uh, okay, can you see the screen? Yeah. yeah, we can see the screen. Yes, great. So, Okay, so I will talk about the fine-grained complexity of parity problems with Amir Abud and Owen Feynman. My name is Sean Fella. So I want to explain how to use the fine-grained complexity to obtain conditional lower bounds. So we start with a popular conjecture that says that some problem X cannot be solved in time better than n to the delta up to improvement in the exponent. Then you reduce that problem X to your problem in time better than N to the delta, again up to improvement in the exponent. Then under the uh, harness assumption, uh, your problem can be solved in time better than N to the delta. And uh, in our paper, we consider the parity version of classical problems studied in fine-grained complexity. And we consider two classes. The first class is a parity computation that asks if a solution for a problem is even or odd. So for example, the diameter parity asks to return whether the diameter in a graph is even or odd. And we also consider the class of parity counting if a, the number of solutions for a problem is even or odd. So for example, the negative weight triangle count problem is the number of negative triangles in a graph. And the negative triangle, a uh, triangle, negative weight triangle, a uh, parity problem asks to determine whether the number of negative triangles in the graph is even or odd. And we show that uh, for many classical problems, finding the exact solution is just as hard as finding uh, its parity. So here we have a table of uh, our results in bold. And this is the table of the all pair shortest path related results. So for example, we show that the uh, all pair shortest path parity is subcubic equivalent to all pair shortest path. So subcubic equivalent means that uh, two problems are subcubic equivalent. Uh, if one has a subcubic algorithm, then both of the problems have a subcubic algorithm. And here a uh, all pair shortest path parity is the parity uh, of the distance between every two vertices in the graph. So that's one result. And we also show that a median parity is a subcubic equivalent to all pair shortest path in the median itself. We show that radius parity is subcubic equivalent to all pair, short, to all pair shortest path in radius itself. We show that a computing the sum of eccentricities is subcubic equivalent to all pair shortest path. And also that a, the parity of is the sum of eccentricities is subcubic equivalent to all pair shortest path. And we show that for many other problems that there, uh, that they are a subcubic equivalent to all per shortest path and to their parity version. And we also have results that are not related to all per shortest path. So for example, we show that a diameter parity is subcubic equivalent to diameter itself. We show that a mean plus convolution is a subquadratic sub equivalent to a, its parity version. Here subquadratic is the same Subquadratic equivalent is the same as subcubic equivalent, but with exponent two, not three. And we also uh, show that uh, certain versions of a uh, knapsack parity are subquadratic equivalent to uh, to their uh, knapsack uh, 
certain, certain versions of NAPSAC are equivalent to the parity version and also to a mean plus convolution. And also we show that a rich, rich uh, centrality parity uh, is a sub a cubic equivalent to diameter and the uh, more results. Uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks. Uh, are there any questions? Well, I think there are already questions from the uh, from the chat box. Yeah, I can see the chat. Can you? Oh. Maybe it's nicer if I read this one because it's a long line yeah. of uh, text, and it was my question. So there is several algebraic parameterized algorithms which also need a reduction from the parity version to just determining whether a solution exists. And on a high level, my question is whether the trick that they employ there is related to what you do in your paper. So let me tell you about the trick they do there. If you have an algorithm that tests whether the parity of the number of solutions is odd or even, then often you can apply the isolation lemma by Mulmuli, Mulmuli, and Vazirani to put a random weight function on your element. And then with good probability, there will be a minimum weight solution that's unique. So that if you can count the parity of the number of minimum weight solutions, then with good probability, you detect a solution if it exists. So this trick is in the context of FPT algorithms often used to use algorithms for parity checking to find if there are solutions at all. And I was wondering if the isolation lemma um, also has relations to the type of reduction you do in your paper. So there are uh, one, two, or three reductions uh, that uh, we don't explicitly use the isolation lemma. We do uh, we do make sure that there is a unique solution, uh, as you said. Uh, then uh, use the uh, use the parity to find it. Um, we don't explicitly use the isolation lemma, so uh, it may be the same. It may be different. I'm not sure. Okay. Any more questions? I also have a quick question. As far as I see, uh, you talked about parity mostly for APSP-related problems and three-sum problems, or only about those? What about OV-related so, problems? Or what? Uh, orthogonal vectors. Any parity problems regard so we, related to orthogonal vectors? OK, so uh, you can consider the problem of uh, orthogonal vectors under uh, on, under the F2, the GF2, the uh, field of uh, zero one, and in that case, it is known to be uh, there is, it's known to be faster than uh, than a quadratic time quadratic time. So, if you just want to know the number of number of solutions, uh, so. There, let me think. There, there are results on, on uh, counting, counting solutions to orthogonal vectors in in finite fields, and specifically of two. Mm -hmm. I do not remember right now if if you can do it faster or it's equivalent to okay, to okay, orthogonal vector. But I can refer to the to the paper, but basically it it, it is somewhat resolved. At least it's shown to be it, the sub somewhat resolved. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Gonna check. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. More. Do we have more questions? We have a couple more minutes. Uh, I could ask one more. So sure. this is again sort of contrasting your results to results in parameterized complexity. There um, is a nice paper. Some of the authors are in the chat room here. It's called On Problems as Hard as CNFSAT. And it basically looks at the exponential time running times of some problems. And there they look at the set cover problem and of a parity version of set cover to count how many set covers of a certain size there are. And as far as that paper establishes, the parity version of set cover is harder than testing uh, whether a set cover of a given size exists. In particular, they don't have a reduction uh, in the other way. 
did your research come up with any problems where potentially the parity version is actually harder than the detection problem? The, uh, no, we usually show that the, we, we do, we have one problem that we show that it's parity version is harder than the decision variant of it, which is the, the problem of negative weight triangle. A, we consider the, the parity counting of negative weight triangle, which asks to return whether the number of negative triangles in the graph is even or odd. And we show that conditionally, a, there is no reduction from this problem to negative weight triangle. So negative weight triangle is not is conditionally not equivalent to its parity counting version, uh, which is interesting because it is known that a approximate counting is subcubic equivalent to a, to the decision problem. So uh, we we provide them more uh, more more interesting detail to uh, this uh, this problem. Okay, nice. Is the um, conditional non-reducibility related to non-deterministic SCTH? Uh, no, so uh, it is conditioned on uh, on all per shortest path not being free somehow. Uh, we, we don't know if, if that's true or not. And in certain ways of proving that you could obtain better algorithms for free some. Uh, so we, we don't know if the uh, all per shortest path is, is free somehow. And under, under the in condition that it is not free somehow, then uh, we obtain that the problems are not, uh, not a, a subcubic equivalent. OK, thank you. OK, thanks. So given the time limit, uh, maybe let's move to the next one. Uh, the next speaker is Tasuki. Izumi, uh, Tasuki, please go ahead. Yes. Can I see the slide? Yes, can I see the slides. Okay. Yep. okay, so the, I talk about my result. It's okay, can you, you all, can I hear you, me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Yes? I'll talk, about, uh, I'll talk about my result about uh, sublinear space, lexical graphic tips for search for panel to read graphs and planar graphs. And this is joint work with Yota Utach. My name is Tais Kizumi from Nagra Institute of Technology. So the, uh, this paper considers a space-bounded version of Lex Davis. Lex Davis uh, sums a, uh, some of the lexicographically older deep source sites. So the, it requires some of the choice of the next unvisited vertices must be specified by the order of the adjacent list of each vertice. So the, it's some kind of special restricted version of the deep source search. So the, this is known as a, some of the a P complete problem. So the, and the our focus is the space competition of the next DBs. And the, of course, this problem itself requires some of the theta n log n bit space for even starting for even starting output. So the, we consider some of the streaming version of this problem. So that we define the next DPS in space, space bounded next DPS as some of the uh, something output in the sequence of the next DPS ordering of all vertices in streaming way. So the, as I said that this is a known as a P complete and a log space reduction. So the, even it is still P complete for restricting the planar graphs and even restricting some of the, some of the more restricted problems, the relaxed problems. And recently now we several prior works achieved uh, some non-trivial algorithm attaining from the order n bit space complexity, but uh, breaking the order n bit barrier is also some of the challenging problem in this context. So the, our focus is that can we obtain some uh, sublinear space, Lex Davis algorithm for bounded, uh, so some subclass of the inputs. And uh, it is also has a relationship between some uh, direct ST connectivity. And directed ST connectivity is uh, some strong relationship to the some 
similar conjectures are in in equal uh, in equal a conjecture. So that this is recognized as, as one of the important problems in the space complexity theory. And the uh, directed ST connectivity problem has a sublinear solution, sublinear space solution like that. Uh, so, um, and the restricted graph class is also considered something like the planar graphs or the orchid with graphs. That's the same as uh, our result for next DFS. Uh, but uh, now the tree with bounded tree with look, look at the bounded tree with case. Uh, now the best possible bound is W log n width. But it requires uh, some tree decomposition as a side information so that it doesn't contain the cost for computing the tree decomposition. So I state our result. Uh, the first result, theorem one, is uh, we have the new next different algorithm for bounded tree with graphs attaining the sublinear space and polynomial times. So the given tree decomposition of with W prime of the input graph. So the it still requires some tree decomposition of the side information of the input. And it attains the next DFS using the order n to order one over epsilon time and the order W time times of the epsilon minus to the minus one n to the epsilon log n bit but, uh, for any constant epsilon. So the, if the epsilon is a small constant, this is a polynomial time, and this is a uh, sublinear space for so relatively large W prime, something like the square root of it. So uh, this, for this theorem holds for directed graphs, because the two is itself is de defined as a, defined for undirected version of the input graph. So uh, we simply omit the uh, direction of the each edges and we define three decomposition of that undirected graphs. But Lex Davis itself can be uh, executed even for dialectic graphs. Uh, Tekano theorem is uh, complements the tree decomposition part of the first theorem. Uh, we also provide a new tree decomposition algorithm only using the sublinear space for relatively smaller tree case. case. So, uh, given a dialectic graph of the tree with W is bounded by L to the half, then we have the tree decomposition algorithm which outputs the readers of order W times of L to the half log N, and it using the order W times N to the half, into the half log scan bit. So that it, it attains a sublinear space for three readers uh, less than L to the half. So the, <clears throat> this is some of the generalized result for the non sublinear space treating convergent algorithm because it only uh, applicable to the constant previous cases. So that this also provides some, the, oh, sorry, this also provides some the corollaries, several corollaries. As a, actually, we can conclude that these four algorithms. So the first one is that Lex Davis using uh, the order n to the bit, n to the epsilon bit for directed graphs of the constant previous. The second one is a Lex Davis algorithm using the order W times of n to the half plus epsilon piece for dialectic graphs of trig with W. The third one is the next if using the order n to the half plus epsilon bit for planar graphs. And the last one is a dialectic ST reachability algorithm for bounded to its graph of with W using the order W times of n to the half bits. So the third one, uh, this one is a fast sublinear Purely sublinear dialectic ST connectivity algorithm for graphs of the relatively smaller bounded tree graphs because uh, this doesn't require the uh, tree decomposition as an input. Thank you. That's all. Thanks. Um, we can start the questions. Is there any question? Maybe I can ask a quick question. Sure. Um, so I was really curious. So you compute this uh, tree decomposition also using uh, sublinear space, but I'm just curious, how do you store, uh, how do you, is, is this tree decomposition, does it have a sublinear number of nodes uh, or how do you? Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a same, uh, it also sounds uh, defined as, a, uh, it outputs uh, all tree decomposition information in the streaming way. 
So the first is it, it outputs the sequence of the contents of the all three bugs. And then it outputs uh, some tree structure. Everything is output in the streaming way. So it is, it is enough to use some tree decomposition information for the algorithm because uh, so that if, if we need some information about tree decomposition, every time we decompute that information. But it is still okay to achieve the polynomial time. But of course, it's not, it's not practical, but anyway, we can achieve the polynomial time. Great, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, so for the time limit, let's go to the next one. Uh, the next talk will be given by Carlos, I guess. Yes, Carlos. Yes. Okay, Carlos, please go ahead. Okay. Can you see it? Is it fine? Yes, we can. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, good. Thank you. So, uh, just a second. Yeah. So. So hi everyone, I'm Carlos Hoppen. So I'm going to give a quick overview of our paper. It's a joint paper with uh, Martin Führer and uh, Vilmar Trevisan. So our motivation comes from uh, spectrograph theory. And uh, so there is, of course, this uh, very traditional definition of similar matrices, which are matrices that can be written as MBM inverse, where M is an invertible matrix. And two matrices are congruent. It's a very similar definition, but instead of the inverse, we have uh, the transpose of the matrix. And a uh, property, a traditional property of similar matrices is that they have the same eigenvalues. That doesn't happen for congruent matrices. However, if we have uh, symmetric matrices that are congruent, they have the same number of positive eigenvalues, negative eigenvalues, so, and eigenvalues uh, equal to sorry. zero. So actually, I cannot. I can only see a, a black screen here. So oh, sorry. So let's see. Let's see if it. Yeah, yeah, it was there actually. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Can you see it now? Sorry. Yeah, now we can see it. Oh, sorry. I I put full screen and something like I messed up something. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, the difference is that then when we have uh, congruent symmetric matrices, we know the number of positive eigenvalues, negative eigenvalues, and eigenvalues equal to zero. And that allows us to find the number of eigenvalues that lie in any uh, interval that we want. And so that's useful for spectrograph theory. But the problem we want to study then is to find so um, uh, a matrix D that is diagonal and is congruent to a symmetric matrix of order n. And of, we want to find one that is uh, a linear time algorithm if we have a convenient decomposition and the, the convenient decomposition will be uh, the tree uh, decomposition. And uh, our problem can be seen or the, the way we solve it at least can be seen in a way similar to traditional Gaussian elimination on sparse matrices. So if we were going to perform uh, Gaussian elimination using a tree decomposition, so here on the left, we have a matrix and the non-zero uh, positions are marked and they give rise to this uh, auxiliary graph, we called it an underlying graph, where we have an edge where whenever uh, the corresponding entries are uh, non-zero and we have a nice tree decomposition of this uh, graph then we can proceed bottom up on the tree decomposition to perform Gaussian elimination and not create new uh, non-zero positions in the matrix. So here, for instance, if you look at the AA entry, like the red one, if we use that position to cancel out the elements on its column, then we are only going to affect the ones that lie in its own bag. And so the fill-in doesn't go up. So that would be the idea. And if we could do that uh, for the entire matrix, then we could put it in row echelon form in order k squared n operations. 
That doesn't work because of possible zeros in the diagonal. So sometimes we would try to get the pivot and uh, it's zero, so we cannot proceed. So that's why this uh, easy uh, idea doesn't work. And so one problem that is related with what we did is to find an algorithm of complexity k squared n to perform Gaussian elimination in a matrix of order n associated with a graph with k. With k. And a recent result uh, by several authors gives order k cubed n. And they actually uh, find, they proceed by finding an order in which uh, Gaussian elimination can be done. And for the tree wave, it doesn't work completely and they use another trick. But uh, so what we do is we do find an order k squared algorithm to compute the diagonal matrix that is congruent. So we change the problems. So we are not doing Gaussian elimination, but we are looking for a congruent matrix. And that means on the difference is that we operate on rows and columns at the same time, right? We, every row operation is followed by the same column operation. And this is best possible up to constant factors and for an algorithm based on Gaussian elimination. And just to give a quick uh, overview, what we do is a traditional thing. We have this uh, tree decomposition. And the tree decomposition, we go bottom up, trying to eliminate uh, vertices. And the vertices here are uh, the entries of the matrix. But then uh, when we have zeros, we need to create some buffer zones where we try to deal with them later. And actually, we then have a structure that uh, every node transmits to its parent. And uh, at this structure, we have these type two vertices, which are the ones in the bag that still need to be treated. And we have this N zero is a buffer zone. And we need to keep things in row echelon form to get uh, the required uh, complexity. But it's uh, in the paper, we explain all the steps. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. We have a couple minutes for questions. I have a question. So you treat uh, matrices whose associated graph has small tree width. Now in structural graph theory, people sometimes look at the click width or rank width of a graph because it can attain much smaller values and can be small on clicks. Is there any hope to be able to do diagonalization efficiently if the related graph has small rank width or click width? So for click width, there is, there is but then, uh, so, in spectral graph theory, we do have some matrices that are very special. And actually there is an algorithm that even uh, we uh, worked with and, uh, and used as an idea for this part, but there all the non-diagonal entries had to be the same. So uh, it, it was much less general, right? Uh, and otherwise uh, I don't, uh, I mean, uh, the complete graph has click width uh, very low, right? So uh, I don't think we could get a for a general matrix that would not work to get such a, a quick algorithm, at least if we, yeah, based on Gaussian elimination, yeah, but, but no, if uh, for general matrices, no, but for very special matrices, yes. And it turns out that some of those very special matrices are the ones that appear in spectral graph theory, like adjacency matrix and so on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jay. I think there is also a question uh, in the chat in the chatting box. Oh, sorry, I have to read it. So like, maybe I just it's a short one. Uh, it says re relating to your open questions, do you have a kind of decomposition or graph class? that you believe it would be feasible to prove a similar result for? Can you, uh, can you read the message? Yeah, 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 I can. I, I'm, I'm, okay. Let me just, uh, yeah, let me just think for a, a moment. I, I put on my video here. Uh, yeah, so, uh, for instance, the, the work of these other authors I mentioned, works would give already a 
the right bound path with and uh, tree partition with. And uh, so I, I'm not sure uh, which uh, the composition, yeah, to, to suggest. But uh, for graph classes, it, it turns out that uh, this type of result, especially algorithms of this type for some particular graph classes, were very useful to prove uh, conjectures about eigenvalues in spectrograph theory. And uh, in some sense, an algorithm like this could, uh, could help. I mean, to, uh, when we run the algorithm and we have control over the entries, we can sometimes things uh, about uh, the eigenvalues. And maybe in this sense, uh, this algorithm and other algorithms of this type can be useful there as well. Oh, great, thanks. Uh, the time is also up. Um, in case that there are more questions, I guess we can move to move the discussions to Slack. And uh, thanks for all the speakers and the participants. And I guess hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Thanks a lot for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.